Artificial intelligence, AI, is already transforming our world and is expected to bring some of the most profound changes in human history. Think of me as a friendly companion who can provide helpful insights. From the way we work, to the way wars are fought, to the very fabric of our societies, it seems set to bring huge opportunities, but others warn it could lead to our own destruction. It's one of the existential risks that uh, we face, and potentially the most pressing one. My name is Maria Ressa, and I'm a journalist from the Philippines. Through our investigations, I became the target of a harassment and disinformation campaign, receiving thousands of death threats online. I received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021 an acknowledgement of how difficult it is for journalists to do our jobs today. I saw firsthand the dangers of tech and its threat to democracy. The design of the systems of social media prioritizes the spread of lies laced with anger and hate. In this special series of Studio B on artificial intelligence, I'll be meeting some of the brightest minds working in the field today. My guest this week is Professor Mike Wooldridge. He's been working in AI research for over 35 years in Oxford and at the prestigious Alan Turing Institute. A prolific author, he's written nine books and over 400 scientific articles on the subject. So, what exactly is artificial intelligence? How did we get here? And is it really a threat to our very existence? It is so good to see you and you know you have been studying artificial intelligence for 35 years but something changed right it grew exponential exponential right after November 2022 after chat GPT was launched how did we get to where we are first how do you define where we are what does the science tell us so artificial intelligence, despite appearances, is not a new field. It's been studied very, very actively right. since, uh, since, since the 1950s. But the truth is that actually progress in AI was really glacially slow until this century. Um, computers in the past just weren't powerful enough and right. we didn't have the data. And we are in the world of big data, and AI is nothing without data. You absolutely need data to, to, to train AI, to use the terminology. And every time you upload a picture of yourselves to social media and you helpfully label it with your name, or your kids do, what they are doing is providing training data training for AI. Social, social media companies. That's literally what their role is in, in doing that. So you need data and you need lots and lots of computer power to be able to build neural networks that were big enough. So around about 2012 or well, so... AlexNet. Tell us about AlexNet. So AlexNet um, was a computer program, an AI program, to do basically image analysis. And it was entered into a competition. And entries in this competition were judged at how well they could interpret pictures in, in images. And the point about AlexNet was that in one year, we saw a step change in capability. And this got everybody's attention. Yeah. And it, it became clear at that point that we really were in a kind of a new era of AI. And that was the point, I have to say, that the big tech companies noticed uh, and started to get really, really, really interested. Can I ask you something sure. very geeky? Uh, you talked about training data, but machine learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks large language models. How do these all fit together? OK. The way that large language models like ChatGPT work is really bizarrely simple. It's just doing exactly what your smartphone does when you do autocomplete. So if you open up your smartphone uh, and you start sending a text message, so for example, I start sending a text message to my kids and I type, have you, it will suggest completions. Right. And the completions might be tidied your room right. or walked the dog. Right? Right. Those might be the likeliest completions of that. So how is it doing that? It's been trained on all of the text messages I've sent my kids and learned that the likeliest completions of have you are either going to be walked your dog or, or tidied your room. So ChatGPT is doing nothing more than that. The difference is the scale. Right. ChatGPT is built with AI supercomputers that run for months uh, and cost tens of millions of dollars to be able to do that training. 
and the training data is basically, it's not your smartphone messages, it's all the digital data available in the world. And the standard way that you build these is to start by downloading the whole of the World Wide Web, right. the entirety of the World Wide Web. Right. So Wikipedia makes up just 3% of the yeah. training data for, uh, for these large language models. So the scale of the data is incredible. Um, there are people who say uh, that this will solve humanity's worst problems, like climate change. DeepMind, uh, which is behind Google Search now because they bought it, also does synthetic biology, right? And that maybe we can use phytoplanktons that can pull carbon out of the air. Like, can you give me your best case scenario? OK, so it is quite remarkable that the discussion around AI either veers to the extremely dystopian, yeah. it's going to be the end of humanity, or the extremely utopian. And there's not actually a lot between those two. The reality is going to be between those two. The idea, I mean, I think Elon Musk was on record recently as suggesting that AI was going to take all our jobs. That seems very unlikely to me, not in the lifetime of anybody in this room. AI will become a tool that most people use in their jobs, but is not going to replace people. I mean, for example, there are going to be lots of applications of AI in education, right. which is going to be really wonderful. But what teachers do is a very human thing. It's not going to replace all of humanity and allow us to spend our lives writing poetry or whatever it is that we would do if we did, didn't have uh, jobs. I think so that scenario is, is, is extremely unlikely. The dystopian scenarios have been really hotly discussed. And people talk about existential risk, and that literally means the end of humanity, that yes. AI could become so powerful that somehow it ends humanity. If it can program itself, if yeah. it can get resources, it can continue doing it without human supervision, right? Yeah. So, so there's this scenario uh, called the singularity. Yes. And it's a beautiful scenario, which makes for great science fiction. <laughs> And is the it idea only is, fiction. Go, go. <laughs> the idea is at some point in the future, at some point, we don't know when, AI is going to be as smart as we are. And at that point, it can start to improve itself. It can literally rewrite its code. And then at that point, it's smarter than we are. And that improved AI can then improve its code again. Itself. Uh, and it just continues that process. And the fear is at that point that AI is out of our control. I, I saw this on Black Mirror. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and actually, of all of the contemporary science fiction shows, Black Mirror, I think, is absolutely it's... by far the best. It's very thought-provoking stuff. So is it? So I've, in all of this discussion, I've never seen a single genuinely plausible scenario for existential threat. And it really has been discussed endlessly with some very, very, very smart people thinking about it. The biggest risks right now are that AI is a powerful tool yeah. and it enables bad people to do bad things, bad things that they couldn't previously have done, that it enables a whole category of risks, not existential risks, but risks like cybersecurity attacks, which would just not have been feasible yeah. uh, previously. That, I think, focusing our attention on those issues, I think, would be much more productive than on science fiction issues. Or AI weapons of war. Right, like AI drones, which they've used in Ukraine, are being used in Moscow. Um, there, again, are no boundaries set on this. And yet, the scientists, with a profit motive, are rushing ahead. And we are like Pavlov's dogs in real time. How can we protect ourselves in this? Because if you look, in, in the Nobel lecture in 2021, I actually said that um, we had data that showed that we're being insidiously manipulated. It has so much of our data that it cuts in through our emotions, information warfare, changes the way we feel, changes the way we think, and then the way we act. Electoral integrity, for example. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that you have now, according to VDEM, 72% of the world under authoritarian rule, right? So these are some of the impact of it. Mr. Scientist, tell me, right, because you don't have a profit motive, right? You're studying the science. How do we rein them in? So I think there's, there's two sets of issues. The first is we, we're pretty confident right now that social media, one of the unintended consequences of social media was a mental health crisis in teenagers. Yeah. And we didn't see that coming, right? But that's just one of the unintended consequences. And I think what you're saying is, what are the unintended consequences of AI going to be? So, for example, what if we end up with some future large language model which 
just completely inadvertently makes us more aggressive or more depressive, for example, and what impact would that have globally? For example, a widely used AI tool that made us more aggressive might lead to more conflict but in the world. But isn't that happening since they took all of the big data, the unstructured big data of social media, full of fear, anger, hate, right? Isn't that happening now? OK, as, as we already mentioned, the way that this technology is configured is you download the whole of the World Wide Web. Yeah. Now, you don't have to look very hard on the World Wide Web to find all sorts of unpleasantness. And I mean, if you go on you know, some social media platforms, they have types of unpleasantness that we could scarcely imagine, right? right. So, and if all of that has been absorbed by a large language model, then it's a seething cauldron of unpleasantness. Now, I think genuinely, you know, responsible AI companies have no intention whatsoever of uh, unleashing that on the world. So what they do is they're building guardrails. And so they try to intercept queries that are, you know, how do I build a pipe bomb? Yeah. You know, they will try to intercept such a query. Yeah. And also they will look at the outputs of the large language model and try to intercept anything which is inadvertently coming out, with it, which is inappropriate. At the moment, those guardrails, I think, are the technological equivalent of gaffer tape. They're just being, you know, they're being plastered Pat onto cheese, these. Right? Uh, yeah, up. exactly. There's no deep fixes yeah. to that. And one of the worries is if this technology is owned by a small group of actors In who develop Valley. this technology behind closed doors, yeah. we don't get to see the training data. So right. you have no idea what this has been trained on about you. And you're a public figure. There will have been a great deal of content about you. And some of it won't have been very nice. That's a safe bet. So this is, I think, a real concern. And this issue of transparency, I think, is, is, is really a concern which needs to be taken very, very seriously. You talked seriously. about guardrails, right? There's no incentive for them to put guardrails in. I mean, they, the only incentive is that they won't be attacked by people, right? It's a reputational thing. But if they can get by without it, they have, as they have with social media. Right? We still haven't done anything. Well, I think here we are in a situation uh, which is very awkward. We've got AI, which has gone viral. Uh, it's the first... Large language models are the first general-purpose, and I'm choosing those words very carefully, right. general-purpose AI tools that have reached a mass market, and they're very powerful. Yeah. And the tech companies see empires they see nascent empires and they want to they want to stake their claim on those empires they want to be those empires they want to be the google they want to be the they want to be the amazon of the generative ai world and a very big risk is that what they're doing to try to get an advantage on their competitors is rush ahead with this technology without thinking about for example whether it's really fit for prime time and that really is a worry um, but these worries are not you know they're not unknown. I mean, the the UK government convened an international AI safety summit, and I have to tell you, there was a there was some scepticism about what it was going to achieve. But actually, the the debate was a, was a sensible debate, uh, and it got it on the international agenda. So I think what's going to be challenging is the extent to which government can really hold the richest companies in the world to account. And the irony, of course, is that if they get it out to all of us. They get all of our data. We train their large language models. They gain more power, even as the very nation states that are going to try to put regulations in place to control them lose power because the technology is already impacting society all around the world, right? It's a tough one. Um, I guess, you know, in, in <laughs> I, I have a bleak picture of this, as you can tell, because having been attacked and to hear them say, you know, well, we didn't intend that. It doesn't really matter what the intent was. And so how do we, what can we do right now? Right? It's moving too slowly. Governments move at the pace of mm. years while the tech evolves in every two weeks. Agile development means they're rolling out code every two weeks, right? So is there anything anyone watching can do? Well, I think there is, there is concretely something we can do. So we're heading into elections in the UK and yeah. the US. The US, and India. One of the very prominent risks with this technology is the possibility of industrialising the production of disinformation and misinformation uh, uh, on a massive scale, on yeah. an unprecedented scale, yeah. and personalising it down to the level of individuals. Yes. So the AI can look at my social media feed and pick up on the sentiments that I express in my social media feed, pick up on my political stance, which is going to be implicit within, yeah. sometimes explicit, within my social media feed, and then feed me 
personally tailored, very high quality misinformation. The sentiment analysis exists to do that. The generative AI makes it possible to do that. And, uh, and, and the cost of launching a disinformation campaign in an election because of generative AI has come down yeah. massively. Yeah. And let's be honest, there are people in the world with a huge interest in disrupting elections in the US or the UK or India and so on. Uh, and it could be people just with an interest in vandalising the process, or it could be state-level actors that really want to disrupt what's going on. So what can we do concretely? I think we absolutely need to be alert to that issue. I think trusted news sources are going to become so valuable. The difficulty with that, of course, is that we end up in a world where, you know, we're, we're all completely paranoid and don't believe anything. But trusted news sources, I think, are going to be essential. And understanding how we can be manipulated, exactly. I think, is really, really important. There is so much more we can talk about yeah. this, because in 2024, one in three people around the world are going to vote. And oh. this is the tipping point for both electoral systems, our democracies. Um, but we're getting to the Q&A. So let me toss it to you. The gentleman in the back was the first hand up. Leading on from what you were saying, Michael, about news and trusted news, given the growth of generational AI technology, which can actually do deep fakes pretty convincingly, both in audio and video uh, on social media feeds, how long before we, the poor public, cannot tell the difference anymore? Well, I think uh, in terms of being able to tell the difference, AI right now can perfectly duplicate your voice to the point where nobody would be able to tell the difference. That's a technology which exists. Deepfake images uh, is not quite there, but very, very close. But I don't know if people saw, did you remember seeing this picture of the Pope in this big puffer jacket yeah. that went viral? Yeah. And I have to tell you, when I first saw that, I didn't actually twig that this was not a, a, a real image. I just assumed it was. And I thought yeah. this was a, a slightly strange clothing choice for the Pope. <laughs> um, so we need to raise our guards for that. And we need, I say, the, the, the issue of trusted news sources is just going to be so, so, so important. You know, they're going to be facing this technology and they're going to need to think of new ways of dealing with that technology. Yeah. But let's hope they can rise to the occasion. I mean, I'll, I'll pick it up and I'm slightly more pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> um, I promise you won't walk out depressed completely, right? Um, I think our shared reality is already broken. The political dominoes on social media of information operations. The political dominoes fell in 2016. Duterte was elected in the Philippines in May. About a month later, you had Brexit, and then you had all of the elections moving. Trump was elected in November. And you know we have the data to show that there were information operations that were there. It plays to our fears, our hatred, I mean, this is playing out right now, and our shared reality is splintered, right? So what do we have to do? Um, news organizations are under attack, both on the business model side, right? Um, the money that used to go to news, uh, we still have to maintain very expensive systems of checking everything, because we stand behind it, we're legally liable. That now goes to micro-targeting. Micro-targeting is not the same as advertising. It goes to your weakest moment to a message. That's, and it's cheap, right? So that's still there. And then Mike is going to bring large language models. We have it there, and we've already seen this. Wow, I sound really bleak. It's only because I was getting 90 hate messages per hour. And in order to keep doing my job, I had to be OK with going to jail for the rest of my life. That's a lot to ask from your journalists. So what do we do? come out in the real world, right? Understand you are being manipulated. Up until the guardrails are put in place, we need to organize ourselves and have a shared reality. This is a shared reality right now. So we want to try to get more questions from the audience. Go ahead. Sadia, UK campaign to stop killer robots. Um, and my question is, um, in your view, what do you think the international community should be doing uh, to address the concerns and challenges of the use of AI in warfare, given that we're seeing this being used in Ukraine and in Israel, Gaza? Uh, well, again, we're, we're stepping well outside my comfort zone. I can tell you, firstly, the international AI community is broadly, but not universally, against lethal autonomous weapons. So in 2015, I was organizing a conference and we had a panel on exactly this topic. And I thought the 
the views were going to be absolutely unanimously against lethal autonomous weapons and was really startled to discover that there are people of good faith who think that no that this is this would this is how my children can avoid having to be involved in warfare. That's literally how some people viewed this. So it was a, it was a more complex issue than I thought. But I, th I can tell you what my perspective is. And my perspective is that I do not think it's acceptable that a machine decides autonomously whether to take a human life. If a human life is taken, then which uh, you know, is, is, uh, is, is an extremely undesirable situation in any case. But somebody who takes that decision on a battlefield has to be able, has to be capable of empathy and understand the consequences, what it means for a human being to be deprived of their life. What can we do with it? Well, we've, we've moved on landmines internationally, imperfectly, but that shows that there are ways ahead with this. At the same time, we need to be realistic. There are nation states that are not remotely interested in the niceties of these issues, and they will develop this technology. Uh, in secret, and we won't see that. And so we do have an obligation to make sure that we can protect against the, 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 the attacks by that kind of technology. I think that's the only realistic and responsible way forward. But um, by and large, the, the crumb of comfort I can offer you is that the vast majority of the AI community think that technology is abhorrent and want nothing to do with it. Let's take one last question. Uh, so AI is being used more and more in recruitment uh, to sift through vast amounts of CVs, which for people of my age is a bit of a concern and obviously a lot of other people as well. Uh, the sad thing about this is that a lot of people don't actually know this and also don't understand what language it picks up into text. And it doesn't necessarily look at niches. So is this a concern that people might miss good CVs and people that would actually be the perfect candidate because they don't know this? And what can be done to eliminate this or at least reduce the risk in the future? Or the inherent biases in the technology actually make those selections? Uh, I'm completely with you on this one. I don't think this is a good use of the technology. I want humans involved in that decision. This, to me, is just lazy and inappropriate HR practice. If a HR manager says, oh, but the decisions will be fairer, I think that's absolutely nonsense. I just don't think that that's something that we should do. But if you think that's not a nice use of the technology, imagine you've got AI as a boss telling you what to do <laughs> moment by moment through your working life. And there are companies pursuing that, you know, looking at every email that you send, yeah, yeah, commenting yeah. on yeah. it. You know, Wooldridge, you know, you only sent 20 emails today. The company average is 22nd. You took five bathroom breaks today. The company average is three. We you know, know that company. kind of... Do you want to live in a world where AI is giving you that kind of thing? I don't, and I dare say you don't either. There are companies pursuing that nonsense now. Yeah, yeah. We won't name it. OK, <laughs> we, we do get one more question. So let's end with the gentleman in the back. He's hand up first. I have a very simple question. Um, we talk about loss of jobs due to AI. Um, do we think in 100 years' time it will be strange to explain to a child that um, the jobs being done in admin and companies were, were done by humans? I think they will find that very strange. Well, the future is going to be not just weirder than we imagine, but weirder than we can imagine. Uh, I have teenage kids who've grown up with the internet and they just assume that it's there and that it's always on. And when it doesn't work, for whatever reason, they're just perplexed and don't understand. You know, something's gone wrong with the world if the, if the internet doesn't work for them. Kids that are seven or eight years old now are going to grow up. They're the first generation in history that's going to grow up being surrounded by very powerful general-purpose AI tools like ChatGPT. And they are going to do the weirdest things with it. And the, the best example I can, I can give you is, is you know, go back to the origins of YouTube, which is 2005 or so. 2005. And you know, nobody really knew what it was at the time. Yeah. You could upload family videos and share them with family members, or you, know, you could upload clips of your favourite TV shows. Nobody predicted YouTube influencers or the fact that people would not just be able to make a living but actually make a fortune by making videos of themselves playing computer games and talking over it. <laughs> and people do. You know, nobody predicted that. In exactly the same way, no, we can't predict right now how our kids are going to use uh, AI in the future. But the basics of humanity are not going to change. They didn't change with rock and roll. They didn't change with television. They didn't change with cinema. They didn't change with novels. The fundamentals of humanity and human relationships are going to be the same. But our kids are going to be creative in ways that we just find, I say, weird and hard to imagine. But for them, it's going to be, it's going to be a ride. He's, again, very 
optimistic. It is a ride, right? But I think this is this moment in time. Uh, this moment in time is critical. We need the science. Um, and we need to curtail the for-profit motive so that we can be safe with the technology. Absolutely. Michael Wildrich, thank you. Thank you so much it's for really been a pleasure. joining us in Studio B, the AI series. I'm Maria Ressa. Thank you for joining us.